welcome to Con Langery, the podcast about constructed languages and the people who create them. I'm George Corley, and with me in Washington, we have someone who needs no introduction, Mark Okrand, the creator of Klingon and Atlantean. Hi. Hi. Good to be here. Mark? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're fighting with some internet issues, but we're going to try to get the show going as well as we can. But uh, thank you so much for being on, Mark. Um, I, you know, you are actually an inspiration for a lot of conlangers, because I think a lot of conlangers saw Klingon, and that was one of the, the things that got them into conlanging in the first place in the, in the community. Um, I know that one of my first languages I made VOS specifically cause I saw it in Klingon. Um, but just wanted to have you on to, to talk to you about, you know, you were one of the first people to create a language for a major property in Star Trek. And I, I just, in terms of what you've seen since that time, could you talk about like, how has that sort of scenario changed? How has that changed in terms of like the number of properties that are putting conlangs in and how they're seeking out conlangers and things like that. Yeah, it's changed a lot. Uh, Cause when I did it for, for Klingon, which was back in 1984, uh, there'd been essentially nothing. That's not quite true. There was a little bit before me. There's a little bit of Klingon before me, um, maybe six, eight lines in the, in the first Star Trek movie. And there was, a, you know, one or two other movies or TV shows where they'd, they'd done actual conlanging made up real, consistent languages and stuff, but teeny tiny bit. But ever since Klingon, and not immediately when, when Klingon came out, but you know, within a number of years, maybe, maybe 10, 15 years, uh, things changed so that now any film, it seems, any, any TV show that makes use of a, a, a people, a civilization or something that's somehow different, it's either, you know, outer space people or some mythological fantasy-like people or something like that. Um, they always now seem to have their own language, and it's always conlanged by somebody who knows what they're doing, and that's a, that's a huge change from the way it was before. I think it's great. I mean, for years and years and years, people making films and TV shows have paid attention to, uh, to, to one degree or another to the science and the history to make sure that that's as accurate as it can be. And in, uh, when it came to language, everybody, you know, in American, North American TV anyway and movies. Everybody just spoke English all the time, no matter what, or or spoke gobbledygook. But no longer, no longer. Now, now when they speak something that's not the you know major language of the film, it's it's legit, it's real, and that's terrific. Yeah, it's it's really great, and it's interesting to think about. Like, I've seen talks by you talking about like the process of doing Klingon dialogue and. Just sort of the, the the general chaos of <laughs> an actor does a line wrong and you being very gracious and actually going through and just like making new Klingon words so, so that this line just happens to be entirely homophonous right. with the other line. Um, I think one of the my favorite things from Klingon and I, I don't know if this is the way that you think about it. You can correct me if I'm wrong about it. Is like, it seems to me like you took like the canon names of of things, and you said, well, this is like a bad anglicization. It's not Klingon. It's actually Klingon. It's not Kronos. It's actually Kronos, and <laughs> just sort of made it fit the Klingon phonology and said, okay, this is what some federation person heard and then turned into whatever that is. 
No, that that's exactly right. I decided, you know, made up the, the phonological rules of Klingon and said, okay, that's the way Klingon works. Uh, people in in the Federation, non Klingon, whatever, they they don't get it quite right. They mangle it a little bit. So, what we hear them saying, what we hear Captain Kirk saying, and and all that is is the anglicized or or Federationized or something version of Klingon, not not the Klingon version. So it was taking all those names and and things that that the writers had made up and and making you know giving them proper Klingon phonology. Yeah. And I mean the you know, the writers are gonna do their thing, the writers are gonna want their specific pet names. Was there anything that was particularly difficult to integrate into Klingon? Like particular names that you looked at that were like, no, oh, this is just like not even Klingon? Well, names in particular, when they made up uh, items, you know, names of weapons or something, that, was, that wasn't so bad. Names were tricky, though, because names tended to violate the rules of, of Klingon phonology, Klingon phonotactics, uh, more than other things. I don't know why that's the case. But, you know, the most famous Klingon of all, I suppose, is Worf. And Worf can't be a Klingon word. Right, you, you you don't you don't have an F at all in Klingon, and even if you did, you wouldn't have R F <laughs> at the end of a word together like that. Uh, and other names they made up too just just don't fit. So I thought about right. that because it wasn't just the one; it was it was a, n a number of different names. I had nothing to do with mm -hmm. making up any Klingon names. Right, they made up for the films and TV shows. They made up all the names, with one exception. Uh -huh. One exception. I made I made up the name for for Worf's father. Uh, I didn't know that that's what I was doing. They just wanted a, a name, and I gave them okay. some name. It turned out to be Worf's father. Who knew? But anyway, Mo, uh, right? What I decided Mo, yeah. What I decided for Klingon names, so that yeah. all these weird names could still fit. Because I, the way I go, I would Klingonize them is to still come up with a pretty weird Klingon. So Worf, for example, is Worf, which is sort of Worf. Um, oh. Decided that the reason th these names are so strange, from a from a Klingon phonological point of view, is because in Klingon culture, Klingon naming practices happen to be that you give your kid a name in another language, so it doesn't have to follow the oh, Klingon. That works. Word. Yeah. So it is very interesting that. Like you have the philosophy of whatever is appearing on screen, you're going to treat as canon yeah. and then you're going to bend Klingon around it to, to fit that. Even when it's like to anyone who knows the pre-existing rules, this is like bad Klingon. I think like if you look at Conlangers today, at least you know, I see David Peterson talking about like when there's a bad edit and he's like, he'd, ju he'd just be like, well, that's wrong. That's not the actual Dothraki that I made or whatever. Right, right. And, but you were working within like what they did. And when they made a mistake, you just said, okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depended on, on when and when, when it happens too. Uh, if, um, uh... If I, if I had any control over it at the time they were doing it, I could make corrections, either either redo it, which didn't happen very often, um, or, or figure out something so that going forward I could mm -hmm. make it fit. But if I didn't know about it until I saw it on TV, I said, okay, I'm, I'm stuck with that. They said it. That's it. Now, now the, the, the people who speak Klingon, because now there's a bunch of people who do, which obviously wasn't the case when all this got started, uh, sort of make a distinction in their minds between between real Klingon language and TV Klingon language if I haven't adapted it yet. Oh, so they have an idea sometimes of when there's there's a mistake on screen that it's like not actually what was Yeah, yeah. They hear things and say, ah oh, no, no, that's just that, that's that's just something that that the actors did or the producers did or something. Yeah. Yeah. But they'll always then they'll come to me and say, Okay, so and so said this What's this all about? You know, that could be years later. Uh, in, in the very first Next Generation episode that had Klingons in it, at that time we weren't paying any attention to it. Uh, 
so years later, and there's, there's just a few lines of, of Klingon in that episode. So years later, people said, this guy, this Klingon guy goes to the food replicator and he orders something. And what he says is gobbledygook. Uh, what does that mean? So I figured out something. Give him something tasty that, that he's ordering from the thing. <laughs> what is the the back and forth between you and like the the Klingon language institute people the the Klingon speakers uh like i i understand that mostly they treat you as like the ultimate authority but is there do you ever draw things from materials that they make or or is it mostly like a one to, one way thing it's it's a, it's a two way street but it's but it's 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 not like two sides of the highway. They're two different streets. The, the the whole organization came into being without my even knowing about it. I didn't know that it even existed until uh, I mean, this is now years ago. It was you know twenty something years ago, twenty eight years ago or something. Um, I got a call from a guy who said he was the head of the Klingon Language Institute, and I said, "What is that?" Right. So he had to tell me all about it, even though it had been at that point in existence for a little while. Uh, but since then, I've gotten involved with the organization to the extent that I know the people who, who run it and, the, and the, a lot of the members, and I go to their annual meetings and, and things like that. And they decided, I did not make this decision, they decided that the ultimate source of who can say what's right and what's wrong is me. Uh, and also the, ult the only, only source of new vocabulary or new grammar rules, if there's to be such a thing, is me. So they come to me sort of all the time, but generally twice a year because there's a big, okay. there's a big meeting of Klingon speakers in uh, usually North America in the summertime, and there's one in Germany in November. Uh, and ahead of these meetings, they say, okay, here's a list of words what are, that, that we'd like to have Klingon equivalents for or explanations or phrases or something, and here's some grammatical things that's, that have been puzzling us. We don't know what to do um, and do it that way. So, so that's that. The requests, mm -hmm. you know, uh, come from them, and the answers come from me. Having having said that, in between times, the ones who are really, really good speakers carry on all kinds of conversations and write things and so forth with material that's available. They don't make anything up in the, in the sense they don't make up any any new morphemes or or any new grammatical rules. But they make very, very clever and I would say correct use of what's there. Uh, to say to say what they have to say. If there's not a word for something, say okay. What 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 can we use? What little sh short little phrase can we use that means this? If there's not a single word already in existence, uh, and some of those get incorporated into the language in the sense that I say, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. You know? And some of them don't, but the ones that don't are usually because I don't know about it. I don't know everything that they're talking about. Yeah, that's that's interesting. The, I mean, I they've translated. The Bible, they've translated Hamlet. Uh, there's the a, a a Klingon opera that is actually performed. It's it's really interesting. How much of like growth have you seen since since you started back in the eighties? And you know, you talk about the Klingon Language Institute formed without you knowing about it. Uh, to me, this sounds like this is sort of because of, you know, pre-internet things. If we had social media in the 80s, you'd probably get tweeted about it immediately. But, like, how much has, like, how much has the, the community changed because of, like, the internet yeah. and the ability to communicate very rapidly yeah. with all kinds yeah, of Yeah, I, I would say that I wouldn't say the community wouldn't exist without the without the internet, but certainly the internet was instrumental in getting it going and 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 keeping it going. Uh, because the the when I was working on Star Trek Three, which is the first film that had Mike Klingon in it, uh, I got the idea of ri of writing a book explaining how the language works, thinking that Star Trek fans might think this is mm. funny or something. I don't know what I was thinking. I was not thinking that people would really learn the language and carry on discussions and translate things. That was not in my mind at the time. Um, and I wrote the book, and it came out in 1980, tail end of 84, beginning of 85, something like that. 
And then a second edition came out around 1992. And that one sold better than the first one. Um, for, for, for whatever he... Well, partly it was because at that point, Next Generation had, mm-hmm. had started and all kind, And Worf was a big deal and so on. Um, but also that's when the internet was really getting going. Uh, uh, we're mutually, mutually beneficial. You know, Klingon, Klingon is responsible for the growth of the internet, of course. Uh, but that's the way people were able to find each other uh, in a way that they couldn't before. And, you know, it wasn't just, I'm the only one who's interested in this language, is there's this other person, this other person, communities formed, and eventually in-person communities formed that, you know, because people knew each other on the internet. But the internet was, I think, I think, really, really critically important to, to getting this thing going. People have been making up languages, you know, people doing conlang, even though it wasn't called that, for, for, you know, for thousands and thousands of years. But everyone thought, gee, I'm just doing this, no one else is doing this, I'm the only one, or maybe my friend, and that's it. Uh, it was the same thing with Klingon, or would have been, I think, the same thing with Klingon had the internet not started going. Now, having said that, of course, there was Star Trek conventions and things like that where people would get together, so maybe people would find each other. But it certainly wouldn't wouldn't have happened in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really interesting to see that. Um, speaking of like the internet changing things, like for me, getting involved in the Conlang community was very much something that happened because of internet forums and things. And it seems that you have, um, in recent years, gotten more involved with, like, more broadly conlanging community stuff. Like, uh, you just gave a talk at Copicon. Um, uh, right. You right. appear in events with the with other with well, at least with the other movie conlangers, with Paul Fromer and and David Peterson, um, what has how what has that been like, and has it like changed anything about like how you view what you've done with your languages, and and what is your view of like the broader conlang community now that you've had some involvement with that. Yeah, well, in terms of the, working with the people who have, who have done other movies and TV shows and stuff, what that's done for me is uh, reinforce something that I knew all along, which is I'm not alone. I'm not the only one doing this. You know, for years and years, if I'd meet people, not people involved with conlanging and, not, and probably not even linguists, um, but they'd say to me, uh, oh, you, you made up Klingon, you made up a language. Wow, how unique, how strange. And I said, it's not strange. People have been doing this for a long, long time. Most people don't get their languages up on a 70 millimeter screen, but people have been making up languages forever and ever and ever. That's not unique. <laughs> and working with the people who have who've done similar things to what I've done, meaning David Peterson and Paul Frommer, right, and, and, and so on, who've done it for movies and TV. So yeah, see, it, it, it's not just me. You know, other, other people are doing it too, which is uh, nice. It's nice to have this little community. It's nice to not feel that, that, that I'm all alone in some kind of a silo doing something or other. Um, but as a result of doing that, to go to the other part yeah. of your question, you know, I've met people in, in, the, in the more general conlanging community, which certainly... Uh, well, I wouldn't say I w- wouldn't have happened, but it was wouldn't have happened as 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 much uh, had had this not happened. Uh, and what I've found meeting these people is how <laughs> incredibly brilliant and creative they are. The kind of stuff that they talk about and do, and the languages they came up with, and the things they're concerned about, and 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 the, and the back and forth cross pollination and all is is just is just brilliant. Uh, and you know, a- absolutely amazing. Now, among the, the Klingon speakers mm-hmm. themselves, they do the same thing, but it's just Klingon, right? And they're brilliant too. They're brilliant too. And what they've done with Klingon yeah. is a lot more than I would probably have done with it all by myself. But the the the, the extent of the I, I've used the word brilliant too many times, but it's, it's really really smart people doing this kind of thing and the kind of things that they're concerned about and the kind of things they fuss about are, are, are so, just so interesting. Yeah. I, I, I do wonder, like, thinking about, like, I think there's still cases of 
people coming into a conlanging project with like pre-existing material or or at least like names to fit to or something like that. But like well, so I would say well, maybe maybe you have actually experienced a difference here. So like you all also did the language Atlantean for Disney's right. Atlantis. Was that a different experience than what you did with Klingon? Like, were you brought on earlier? Was there, was there more control on your part, or or how was that? Uh, yeah, that was that was very different uh, in a number of different ways. Um, in in no particular order. One one way was with Atlantean. I did not work with any of the actors. At the, but another difference that that you just mentioned is with Klingon. Well, Klingon initially was just for Star Trek Three, and it was only, I don't know, a dozen lines. Well, it's probably more than that. But however many lines, 20 lines, something, that's it. Uh, and not very much time to do it. I mean, you know, several months, but, but not gobs and gobs of time. Um, Atlantean was yeah. a four-year project, because I got involved with that four years before the film came out. And a lot of ongoing discussions with the producer and the directors of that film about the language and about the writing system, which I did not do. Other people did it, but we talked about it a lot. Oh. And the jumping off points for the two were very different. What I mean by that is mm -hmm. for Klingon, um, well, first I knew about the Klingons because I'd seen them on TV and I read about them in the script. Right, So there was some some cultural information I had about them, not not as much as we've had since then, since yeah. Next Generation. They've been around. fleshed out a lot. Um, so I knew a little bit about about the people whose language, you know, who'd be speaking this language I was I was going to create, right? And there was also a teeny bit of language that that preceded me because there's a few lines at the very very beginning of Star Trek the Motion Picture, uh, and the people who made that up, which is uh, two people primarily, is John Polville, who was one of the producers, and James Dillon, who was the actor who played Scotty. The two of them came up with the, with that Klingon. Uh, were very concerned with what it sounded like not so much with grammar and vocabulary and stuff like that but that was a start i had to make use of those words or phrases or whatever you want to call them so i wasn't starting from zero so i wasn't starting from zero in terms of who 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 is the speaking right. community and i wasn't starting from zero in terms of the phonology anyway i was in terms of grammar and stuff um and, and went from there and also and also knew that uh, i'm making up a language of people from another planet. So there's no reason for their language to resemble a language on Earth except for the fact that human actors are the ones who are going to say it. So I had to make it pronounceable, even if it was weird and stuff like that. Uh, for Atlantean, I knew very little about the Atlantean people. I'd read the script, but there was but just, you know, that that's all there was to know. Uh, I didn't have any any background from seeing them on TV earlier or something like that. Uh, and there's a line in, in the film, in the script, well, there's a scene in the script, in the, in the film, uh, where the explorers uh, get to Atlantis and they encounter the Atlantean people and the Atlantean people are speaking Atlantean to them, which of course the explorers don't understand and the Atlantean people quickly realize that the explorers don't understand. So they try out other languages, the Atlanteans do. Uh, and they try out, you know, I forget which one, Spanish and French, Chinese or whatever, whatever it is, they're, they're doing different things and very, very quickly uh, figure out that English is the language that they should use and then proceed to talk English to the explorers. And one of the characters, the explorer says to, you know, the hero of the movie, Milo Thatch is the hero of the movie. He's a linguist. And he's the main guy in the exploration team. Uh, they say to him, you know, how, how did they learn our language so fast? How did they learn English so fast? And Milo says, well, that's because their language is a root dialect. You know, it's the language that all the languages on earth came from or something like this. Um, <laughs> and I said to the director, producer, I said, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really work like this. <laughs> there should be another reason that, the, that they're speaking English. Uh, and, I think I came up with two or three different explanations or something, but the line ended up staying in the movie anyway. So I said, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that whatever they're speaking is really the language that all languages of the world came from, 
but I have to make up something that has characteristics such that Milo could come to that uh, uh, conclusion, even if he's wrong. Right. So instead of making a language that's as okay. different as I could from from Earth languages, like for Klingon, I made a language that's sort of as common as I could. It had very, very, very common sounds, very, very common grammatical uh, structure for vocabulary. If I could find a, a relevant word or root or something in Proto-Indo-European or Proto-Sino-Tibetan or something like that, I would I would incorporate it into the thing, as long as it didn't sound like English, which a lot of the Indo-European things did. Uh, okay. And if, if I couldn't find it, then I'd just make stuff up. So there, there, is, there was a effort to make it Earth language-like, in a way. Okay. And with Klingon, okay. there was an effort to make it not Earth language-like, in a way, even though I didn't fully achieve either one for either one. Oh, okay. Interesting. See, I would had been under the impression that Atlantean was like an Indo-European language, but what you're telling me was like, okay, the 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 writer people have said that Milo thinks this is proto world, which doesn't make any sense, but. We'll go with that and make something that sounds like it could be maybe proto world. It sounds sounds like something that would spark that idea in Milo's head. Again, whether he's right or wrong, it would it would say, "Hey, maybe this is why that that, that might fit the facts." Let's see. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 interesting. It's always interesting to have that back and forth in terms of like what the writers think is good world building versus what the linguist knows about how things actually work and, and that. So, and it's also interesting that like you're interpreting that in a way of like, this is his statement. This isn't actually necessarily true, but it's like a hypothesis that he came up with based on limited exposure. Right, and it fits, and it fits what it, it fits what's been presented to us in the film. It doesn't come out of the from out of the blue. Yeah, I do wonder with having to go, going back to Klingon with having to fit to pre existing material. Um, if you had been brought onto that project earlier and been able to help design Klingon from the beginning, do you think you would have done it any differently? Probably, but don't ask me what would be different, because I don't know, <laughs> since I didn't ever have to sit around and think of, okay, we're starting from scratch, what should I do? I, I never considered altered, altered, alternate forms of Klingon. You know, I have made up uh, languages or language fragments uh, for other Star Trek uh, races, if you want to call them that, uh, so I have have thought of stuff that's very un Klingon and and un English, un French, un Chinese, whatever. But for Klingon in particular, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done differently. The grammar was all my own, right? Right. Because there was there was no no way to figure out from those half a dozen lines or whatever it was what the grammar was all about. Right. Um, uh so there that, was no grammar. That may or may, that may, or may, may or may not have been the same. I don't know. Yeah. And the vocabulary initially uh, was all what was needed for the film and nothing more. So, you know, the, the first batch of words that I made up for Klingon were those that were needed to translate the lines in the script, period. Right? Mm -hmm. And they never talk in the script, they never talked about, I'd, you know, I'd like a, a bowl of spaghetti, so I didn't make up a way to say bowl or spaghetti. You know? That's that's super interesting. The just the the difference in the process, the 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 having to fit to just pre existing gibberish and all of the things that you've you've sort of rationalized in order to make Klingon make some kind of sense and also make like statements made about Atlantean make some kind of sense. It's it's a very interesting approach that you have to making these languages 
Um, do you envision yourself like doing any more of this kind of work in the future? Like, you know, if you were contacted by Hollywood studios now, would you take on another conlanging job or would you pass it to other conlangers, you, you know, or, or what would you, These, other linguists yeah. that you know? Yeah. Yeah. These days, these days, if it's if it's really starting from scratch, uh, I'll pass it on to somebody else. Uh, it's 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 that time, for for a lot of reasons. Uh, if it if it's if it's Klingon, uh, then yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do Klingon, and I do that that happens. On the other hand, there's other people doing Klingon for Star Trek as well, uh, in Star Trek Discovery that 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 show. Um, the first season, uh, plot-wise, was heavy on Klingons. Was, they, they had a, a strange new look, but there was Klingons all over the place, and there was Klingon language all over the place. A lot, lot, lot more Klingon language in that than in anything else, you know, by far. And I didn't do it. I didn't. I didn't do any Klingon for that show. So all of the words that were used were mine. The grammar was all mine, okay? But the actual translations were done by somebody else. They were done by Robin Stewart, who is one of the best Klingon speakers in the world, and a guy called Alan Anderson, who's another one of the best Klingon speakers in the world, you know. Um, uh, they, were, they were the ones who did that. And they're, they're sort of, I think, in the Star Trek Rolodex of people to call if, if Klingon is needed. And that's great. That's wonderful. I'm not, I'm not upset by that. I'm not actually pleased by that for a number of reasons. Flattered. That the you know that the language is such that other people can is that is that a state that other people can take it and 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 translate all these strange things that they had to translate and there's other people too I think you know Star Trek in particular has like a a group of I don't know four or five different people that they called for the different languages yeah I um I know that I've interviewed uh, Britton Watkins and I believe he did some. Uh some uh, coaching for like the reboot movie, some Klingon coaching. And I know th yeah, that's the, really there's, interesting. There's Klingon. Uh, yeah. No, what I was going to say is, is in, in the, in the reboot movies, the three of them, there's, there was Klingon in, in the first two and there's none in the, in the third yeah. one. Uh, and in the second movie, uh, they cut way back from what was originally there. And this is not unusual at all. I mean, in movie making, you're making these kinds of changes in post-production all the time, so it's no big deal. Uh, and Britain was on set for the second movie. So I made up the lines, but Britain coached the actors in saying the lines. Uh, but what ended up happening, and he did a great job, and the actors did a great job, uh, but what ended up happening is they edited this one. They edited it so much that it, there was only one scene left that had Klingon language in it, and they edited it so much that the Klingon that was left didn't make any sense. They they shortened it. They took the end of one sentence and put it at the beginning of another one, or they started a sentence in the middle of the sentence and threw away the beginning. I forget what they did. They just scrambled it all up, um, and they realized that it didn't make any sense anymore. Um, and the pronunciation was gorgeous, yeah. but it just didn't make any sense. And it certainly didn't mean what the, what the new subtitles were going to mean. So they gave me a call, and they told me this. And they said, basically, that they had three choices about what to do about this situation. One was ignore it and just go with what they got. And they said, you know, once upon a time... They could have gotten away with that, but not anymore because the audience is paying attention. There's people who really speak Klingon out there who will know that this just this doesn't work. So we can't do that. We have we have to we have to have to do it properly. And there's two proper ways they thought of doing it. One is shoot it over again. And that's not going to happen at this late stage. And the other is the one that they did. They or asked me <laughs> if it were possible and then we ended up doing it, which is. We. Um, uh, they, they played me or, or sent me a, a video of the scene and I made up Klingon, basically Klingon gibberish uh, that 
sounded like Klingon and matched the lip movements that were already there. And when I say gibberish, it's not really gibberish because I had to make it be real Klingon, right? Um, so I could make up new vocabulary and did to, to make all this made sense. But I couldn't make up new grammar. So grammatically, it had to fit in with, with, with what Klingon was there. Uh, I had already existed. So uh, we did this. And there was only two speakers in, in what was left. Uh, there was Uhura, actually a non-Klingon, uh, who does most of the talking. Uh, and listened to her lines and figured out how to how to change you know this to that and make the make the mouth mouth movements work for the new the new lines and then there was one guy one klingon guy who has basically one line uh and when i listened to him i didn't understand at all what he was saying you know with with the uhura lines zoe saldana uh who, who worked with britain uh, what, what, what was recorded there was, was beautiful and, and clear. It's just chopped off in the middle of a sentence or something. Uh, but with this guy, and Britain worked with him too, <laughs> it, it didn't make any sense at all. I said, no, no, Britain was there. Britain did a good job. What is going on here? This guy doesn't even sound like he's talking Klingon. He sounds like he's talking backwards. I said, oh. So I looked at my notes to see what lines he might be saying, because there was a bunch of lines that it might have been, but only one was left. And I said, I think it's this one, and I wrote it out phonetically backwards, and then listened to him again, and that's exactly what it was. So I called up the movie people and then said, is this guy talking backwards? Are you playing the film backwards? I know it's not film, whatever it is these days. Um, and they said, yeah, it goes backwards. And I said, why? <laughs> And they said, because it looks better, and we knew we were going to replace the audio anyway. So I had to make up new Klingon that meant what the new subtitle said and be grammatically accurate with perhaps some new vocabulary and match the lip movements of some guy talking Klingon backwards, right? So all the, all the great work that Britain did did not end up in the film. Yeah. Well, hopefully they had someone doing dialect coaching for the ADR work they had to do later. That but, was good. Uh, <laughs> that, that yeah, was that's... Good. <laughs> that... That is always, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so with collaborating with the other, or I won't even say that. I'm, I'll I'll let you define. So when you have other people doing the dialect coaching or do, doing the translation for Klingon now, like how much collaboration with you is there? Do they, do they email you questions or do they, do they like talk to you or are they mostly just going for with your materials, taking your materials and applying it? It's the latter, you know, they're doing, they're doing it all on their own. It, again, it's, it's my grammar and, 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 and vocabulary and morphology and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they're they're making use of that with with extremely rare exceptions. You know, every once in a while they hit, they would hit a stone wall. But it's just like over the course of the, of the series, two words, three words, something like that. Now, for for another interest, interesting thing that happened with Discovery, uh, for the first season of Discovery, this, the Klingon season, um, that year Discovery was on. Uh, it was streaming, I guess, in in the U.S. on was now it called Paramount Plus, whatever it was called then, CBS All Access, it was called, and it was on something or other in Canada, I don't know what, but everywhere else in the world it was on Netflix, and on Netflix for anything, not just Star Trek, but for anything, you know, you can use to watch subtitles in any of a number of languages. So you could watch a German show with French subtitles and an English show with. Uh, Spanish subtitles and the Spanish show with German subtitles and so on, all that kind of stuff. For Star Trek Discovery season one, you could watch the entire season with Klingon subtitles, right? When they're talking English, there's Klingon subtitles. Um, <laughs> and I didn't do that either. I was involved. in 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 uh, Picard, right? No, 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 no. It's in regular Roman characters. The the the. Uh, it, I, I assume the TV that's technology been... does not support Picard. Oh, it's in, it's in, oh, I, it would be impossible to do Picard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. There, there's a guy leaving Litar. So they had someone translate the entire script. 
Right. The entire script. Um, this guy in Germany, Levin Littar, did it. Uh, and I worked with him a little bit while he was doing it because there was a whole lot more English to be translated into Klingon than there was Klingon to be translated, you know, in, uh, spoken Klingon in it. So he had a, lo a, a lot of questions about vocabulary uh, that, the, that the ones doing the Klingon dialogue didn't have to deal with. Uh, so I work, work with him a bit on that, but it's all his work, or, or, or virtually uh, all his work. Yeah, It's interesting, too, because the way it worked is, is the program was subtitled in Klingon, meaning the whole program was subtitled in Klingon, including when they were talking Klingon. So the first time I saw that show, actually, I wasn't home. I was, I was in Belgium uh, and watching at a friend's house. And the program begins, and I said, turn on, turn on the Klingon subtitles. I want to see how the Klingon subtitles go. So, okay, so we turn on the Klingon subtitles, and the first, I don't know, 10 minutes of the show or something is people talking Klingon with Klingon subtitles. And after a little while, my friend turned to me, and he said, well, this is all very interesting. I don't have the slightest idea what anybody's saying. Please turn on subtitles in another language, right? <laughs> Oh, that's that's great. I did not know that they did the whole thing. That has to be like some kind of landmark that your language. Yeah, it's just yeah, just that season. Just that um, season. yeah. So, I mean, with all of these other people doing Klingon, do you feel like you know Star Trek is not going anywhere? I don't think. It's it's been going for what like seventy years, sixty seventy years. Uh, do you do you feel like in the future that years, yeah. that years, you'll yeah. be just handing off Klingon to the the speakers and and Paramount will continue just hiring them to do all the Klingon in the future. And do you feel confident about them carrying it forward? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they're doing. They're. they're I mean, Paramount is doing that already. <laughs> so, so certainly they'll they'll continue to do that. But in terms of the the, the continued growth and development of the language, uh, you know, w one of these days it's not going to be me for sure, um, and it's going to be these other people. And it's I, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work itself out. But there's there there's incredibly good hands uh, to to put it into, so I'm not I'm not concerned at all. Yeah. Okay, that's that's really amazing. And, you know, and more and more and more people, people. I would say right now, there's more and more Klingon being done for things other than Star Trek. The Klingon speakers are producing a lot more stuff in Klingon than than is needed for, you know, an episode here and there of of, mm -hmm. of a TV show or a movie or something like that. So people are translating things and writing novels and songs and poetry. There's uh, videos on YouTube, all kinds of stuff going on in, on in Klingon that has nothing to do with Star Trek. So it's, 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 yeah. it's going and growing. Oh, I've seen, I've seen some Klingon music videos and I've seen it, you know, incorporated into other properties even. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, I would say it's, it's it's amazing to see that this one particular language has has sort of transcended and even it's like there is also a klingon culture on earth almost because you have the opera and you have music videos and all that stuff out um what was i where was i going with that <laughs> um <laughs> you know that's the from a from a conlanging point of view that that's 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 interesting too because because when you make up a conlang one of the things you do i think is think about who is this conlang for why why am i doing this i'm going to make up a language why am i going to do this you know who's going to speak it or assuming it's spoken um so you have some kind of uh, a culture in mind a fantasy world an outer space world whatever it is uh, some some lost uh, population on Earth. I don't know whatever people are going to be speaking this thing, uh, or you're doing it to to 
test the you know how far you can stretch particular grammatical things uh, and so on. Um, so there's all kinds of different reasons to do it. So for Klingon, the reason for doing it initially is it was the language spoken by these outer space people doing their outer space things, and it's some planet that's not Earth, and they're mean and tough and warrior-like and all that, but they're their own society and talk about whatever it is they talk about up there. But the people who are interested in the language happen to be people on Earth you know, in the 20th, 21st century, and they talk about Earth things. And initially, there wasn't enough vocabulary to do that in any, in any smooth way. Uh, and the growth of the language more and more and more is, uh, vocabulary-wise anyway, is earth, earth things, yeah. you know, things that humans talk about uh, and stuff like that. Not, not dilithium crystals, no. right? It's sugar crystals that you put in your coffee. So it's a whole, it's a whole different whole different direction that it's going. So it's a it's a you know. So who is this language for? Who's speaking this thing? Is it these outer space people, or is it everybody here on Earth? It's just another language, like Spanish, French, and, and, and Esperanto, for example. You know, is another language. It's a, it's an interesting thing that's going on. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a thing for all 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 the conlangers that do stuff for like these these properties is from now on thinking about the potential for that because I mean I think often I think nowadays it it's going to always depend on like contracts and stuff and whether like the studio allows you to do further building or whatever but um, any one of these could catch on with the audience and now you've got to think about the the culture that you're building this for in world. And then you've got to think about the real world audience of the thing, which most con langers are not thinking about it because we're doing it for ourselves. But like when you're doing it for the properties now, I think that's going to be a factor. Um, exactly. Yeah. And you know, and this is, this is not, as, as you say, this is this is not unique to Klingon. There was a very interesting gathering about a year ago uh, at MIT in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, the, they, up there, they were doing a study. They were doing brain scans on speakers of conlangs to see if when you when you process a conlang is the same part of your brain firing uh, as, as when you process whatever your your native language is or, or a natural language or something like this. And so there was a speakers of Klingon and Navi and Esperanto and Dothraki and uh, and then probably something else that I'm forgetting, um, sort of all all together in the same place at the same time. And then and and the speakers talking to each other learned about the other languages or the other language communities. And although there are differences, there are certain commonalities. And this. This one about making use of a of a language that's created for one culture but using it for another one uh, was kind of across the board. So, for example, uh, in, in in Navi, the language from Avatar, the Navi people don't sit down because that's, that's something about their their bodies or, or whatever. So there's you know so there's no word for chair. But of course, the Navi speakers on Earth do sit down. What are they going to do for a word for chair? And so they had to deal deal with this. The, the Navi speaking community on Earth had to deal with it. The Navi speaking world in, uh, on the on the Pandora planet did not have to deal with it. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting. Yeah, because the tail would prevent them from sitting the way a human would, right? Okay, that's that's interesting, and it yeah. is interesting now that like. There's this cross pollination, yes. and that's another interesting, interesting thing too about, about, yeah, yeah, that it sparked another thought about about making up a language for for other other beings, other creatures, is um, you know typically for years and years and years up until Klingon, and it's not because Klingon is so wonderful, but chronologically speaking. Uh, if you go traveling around outer space and encounter any kind of creature, whatever they look like, look like sort of human-like or look like a lizard or look like anything, they, they talk generally. If it's an American movie, they talk English, right? Um, 
but their their mouths don't necessarily want to do that if there's some kind of another other sort of creature. So I've I've worked on a couple of languages where I looked at the character, at, at what the character looks like, what their face looks like, what kind of appliance they're wearing as, as part of makeup. Say, okay, you know, making this kind of a sound would be something that would be difficult for them to do. So whatever their languages wouldn't have that sound, right? So that kind of thing, paying it, paying it in the same way you're talking about the the, the navi and, and sitting down in the tails. Yeah. If your lips don't go together in a certain way, maybe you can't make rounded vowels. That kind of thing. Oh, that's a that's that's a huge thing to to think about. Um, I just recently started making a language. It's my version of the draconic language that's listed in D and D, right? So it's for dragons, right? And so. Like one of the first decisions, I'm doing this on a stream and going with over it with my audience, and we kind of decided that they would be able to do bilabials, ba 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 pa pa pa, but like their lips wouldn't be quite flexible to do rounding. And I don't know if that's the right, light right. Um, okay, I didn't. Decision. I didn't know that. The yeah. example I just gave. Yeah, I, I mean that. I don't know if that's right. I'm not a herpetologist. I don't know exactly h- how capable something with <laughs> reptile lips would be of pronouncing different things. But that was the reasoning that we had. And you you got to think about if you're doing stuff for aliens that are not like humanoids, like Klingons are, they could have beaks. They could have like no nasal cavity. They could have all kinds of differences that would restrict what sounds they could do, or they could have differences that make them able to pronounce things that humans can't. In which case, if you want to do that, then you've got to bring in the sound guys and teach them some linguistics, (laughs) which I don't know if anybody's done. Right. (laughs) Um, I think... I think uh, I know that they've taught them linguistics. They've certainly brought them in for various things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The sound effects languages tend to just be sort of gibberish. Um, I would say not always. I made up a language for was it, for, for discovery, mm-hmm. uh, which which is a language that that from a from a phonological point of view, I really like. I really like the way it sounded. The actor did a great job. But when they when they produced it, when they did the post production for it, they they electronically did something or other to it to make it echoey or oh. different pitched or something. So it sounded very strange and it was effective for the television show. But you couldn't hear the keen phonology that I made up anymore. So, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, and that's... then they killed the character, so we're never going to hear it. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess they they didn't they didn't think that that was an important part of it to preserve. But uh, that's interesting. That's, well, yeah, right, and that's and that's another thing to think about when 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 working on the films and the TV and stuff like that is is what the writers and the producers and the director and all those people are yeah. primarily concerned about is what does it sound like? Yeah. Because what it means is what the subtitles say, and they're not all that concerned about about grammar or specifics of vocabulary and stuff like that. They are very concerned about what it sounds like, uh, right? And, they, and you just have to understand that as as a, as a conlanger in this field, if there's a, a field, that's something that you just have to bear in mind. And from what I've talked to other people who have worked on like these conlanging projects, they care about what it sounds like but they're not very good at describing what it should sound like. A lot of describing things as harsh or guttural and right. <laughs> things that a linguist don't know what that means. Right. Yeah. Klingon in, in the script. Exactly. Exactly. In the script for Star Trek three, it says explicitly that Klingon is a guttural language. <laughs> All right. What does that mean? You have to figure that out. So we'll stick a uvular African in. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um that's what I did. <laughs> well, I think I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much for coming on, Mark. Um and uh as a last it's been thing, fun. thank you. Yeah. 
Do you have any like general advice to all of the conlangers out here who they may have been inspired to get into conlanging with for by you or just anything any any sort of little nugget of advice you'd like to give as a parting thought? Yeah, do it. Just keep doing it. It's it's fun, you know, uh, and and you're gonna learn so much uh, about about the language that you're making up, but also about other languages, including natural languages. It's, it's an incredible field. Yeah, I I I concur with that. I will say, I started conlanging in high school, and then I ended up getting a PhD in linguistics. So <laughs> that could be the future. <laughs> See? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for being on, Mark. Uh, and I was it, very happy to have you on. And uh, and thank you all for listening Good. or watching, as the case may be. And I'm going to say happy conlanging. Special thanks to my patrons on Patreon. If you go over there right now, you can get early access to episodes. You can get access to scripts for my solo episodes. And you can go get access to exclusive polls for Tongues and Runes. Thank you to Cassandra Woodhouse, Miles Ronovich, Jake Penny, Artifexian, Nicholas Norblog, Viren Patrick, Eloy Mariana Mentuleum, Sigourney Hunter, Sylvia Sotomayor, Connor Stewart Rowe, Jeremiah, Anthony Dosimo, Jack Keynes, Graca Grunk, Grammar Antifa, K, Kenan Kigunda, Mintaka, Alexis Hugelman, and Jesse. Con Langery's theme music is by Null Device. Con Langery is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0 International License.